Namaste. So yesterday, Michael McClure and I had a really interesting conversation on our private secret channel. And I wanted to share that with you all today because the realizations and such are just very important for understanding how the path works. Let's take a look at this chart. The Sri Vidya is divided into two paths, the Kaula and the Samaya. Now, in the thousand names of the goddess, Lalita Sahasranam, there are four names that refer to the Kaula path, Kulangana, Kulantastha, Kaulinya, and Kula Yogini. Kula means home, and it's the name of the Shushumna, the central spinal channel, because this is where the goddess resides. This is where the life energy flows in a circuit from the Muladhar, the lowest chakra, the root chakra, to the Sahasrara, the highest chakra. So the Kula is the home. The path is called Kaula. Kaula is the possessive form of Kula. In Sanskrit, many possessives are made by simply extending the, the first vowel. It is. And the practice connected with that path is Tantra, physical Tantra, sexual Tantra. The other path is the Samaya path. And this is the conventional religious path. And the names of the goddess connected with that are Samayachara and Samayantasta. Her names reveal that these paths are ancient and accepted in Vedic scriptures. Uh, don't let anybody tell you, for example, that the Kaula path is something bad. Uh, they call it the left-hand path. But actually, <laughs> it's very ancient and sanctified when it's done right. Now, when it's used as an excuse simply for sense gratification, that's, that's not acceptable. Uh, but when it's done as an act of worship to try to realize the goddess by the Tantra process, which we're going to discuss today, then it's very holy and sanctified. So let's take a look at the other chart. You've seen this before. This is the chart of the four darshanams, right? So I'm not going to go over this. <laughs> you've heard it at least a dozen times by now if you've been following this channel. If you haven't, go back and look at some of the previous videos. But this is new. This chart shows how, as the energy rises up the kula, the central spinal channel, where the cerebrospinal fluid flows uh, between the gonads and the top of the head, there are three, uh, there are four resting places and three knots. We could also call them gates or uh, obstacles on the path. And you'll see why I call them like that in just a minute. So what happens is that as a person increases in qualification, the focus of their life energy changes. In the beginning, when someone's in Dvaita Vada, they think the world is real, they think their body is real. They think that they have to use their body to do everything. They are located in the Svadhasthana chakra, the low, the energy chakra. Okay? And their yoga is karma, and the result of that yoga is punya, which leads to higher situation. Now, when that energy is brought to its highest value, they can penetrate through the Brahma Granti and reach the next stage, Vishishta Dvaita. Vishishta Dvaita is 
the method of the Madhya Madhikari. And its chakra is the Manipura or the heart chakra. That's why bhakti is connected with love and emotions. So bhakti yoga is their process and it leads to prema, ecstatic love of God. When this reaches the highest level, they can pass through the Vishnu Granti and reach Vivartavada. Now this is for the Tivra Adhikari, the ripe sadhus. Uh, tivra means ripe. And they reside in the Agnya Chakra between the eyebrows. And their yoga is Raja Yoga, which results in Shunya realization of emptiness, that all this material manifestation is nothing but an appearance and is just empty. It's like a mirage. That leads to penetrating the Shiva Granti and attaining Ajatavada. Ajatavada, <coughs> excuse me, is complete self-realization. At that time, they become an Atitivra Adhikari, fully ripe, and they reside in the Sahasrara Chakra and practice Jnana Yoga to realize Brahman. So now the question comes up. What is the nature of chakras? And what is the nature of these gates or knots or obstacles of the path? Why do people remain stuck, for example, uh, in a lower state of consciousness? Why can't they simply rise up immediately to the Sahasrara? And the answer to that has to do with what we call vortex theory. <laughs> this is wild. I first came on vortex theory while studying the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha compares the uh, attachments of a person's consciousness to a whirlpool. Sangsara, in general, is compared to a whirlpool. Now, of course, the nature of a whirlpool is that it goes around and around. Huh? And in physics, this is called a vortex. And a vortex develops when there is a flow, a flow of energy or a flow of a medium of any kind. And that flow encounters an obstacle. So when there's an obstacle in the flow, a vortex will develop. Here's a couple of pictures from a uh, scientific apparatus showing how vortexes develop around an obstacle. And you can see they're like little curls or spirals, little whirlpools of energy. When the life energy, the prana, the kundalini energy, sex energy, flows through the kula, it encounters certain obstacles. And what are these obstacles? Our attachments. <laughs> so the Brahma Granti, for example, is our attachment to the physical body. Everything that Brahma has created, the world, the senses, the body, all these objects, all our so-called possessions and relationships and titles and designations and so on and so forth. These are our attachments. They have to be overcome. Basically, one has to realize, I am not this body. I'm not this mind. I am pure energy. When that happens, one can rise to the next platform of bhakti, spontaneous bhakti. Hmm? There is no such thing as bhakti under rules and regulations. Actually, that's karma yoga. Let's be honest about this now. Some people try to pass off their rules and regulations based religious uh, process as bhakti, but that's not bhakti. Love cannot be legislated. Love cannot be commanded, directed, managed, <laughs> or uh, 
manifested on demand. Huh? Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody who's really clingy and they try to force you to love them? How did you feel? Like, ew, get away from me, right? So love cannot be forced. It cannot be created by rules and regulations. Rules and regulations can, however, create punya, which then leads to uh, knowledge, development of detachment, and realization of the next stage. So when one becomes a Madhya Madhikari, then he's eligible for actual bhakti, which is spontaneous, purely spontaneous from within the heart. That is beyond all rules and regulations. That's stated right in the bhakti scriptures. But people don't understand what it means because they're conditioned by oppressive uh, organizations and religious teachers who are not realized themselves. So when one reaches this stage, then the obstacle becomes those very emotional feelings. And one gets hung up on a certain emotional taste, which is called rasa. This taste is the cause of the ecstasy that leads to prema. But it's not the, the final ecstasy. It's not the real ecstasy. And there is a similar stage in the Buddhist process of uh, jhana. Uh, the, uh, it's either the third or the fourth jhana is called rapture. And it's ecstasy. And a lot of monks get hung up on this ecstasy. And they can't go further. Why? Because they're attached to it. But when this attachment is overcome by knowledge, then one can pass through the Vishnu Granti and reach Vivartavada. And in Vivartavada, <laughs> the attachment is form in general. Huh? Form, structure, ontology, the uh, framework or background that we see as the uh, nature of the world, the nature of reality. And in this stage, we, we know, we have information that this world is simply an appearance, an illusion. But we have to realize it. And that realization is done by overcoming the attachment to form by meditation on the void. This process is called neti neti, not this, not this. Uh, so, by practice of this neti neti, one realizes shunya and then can pass through the shiva granti to ajatevara, and that's the final enlightenment. Now, we also had a, a, a very interesting conversation uh, based on the jnana kanda of tripura rahasya. Now, actually, I don't like to talk about this very much because Jnana Khanda depends on the Mahatmya Khanda as its context. And nobody knows the Mahatmya Khanda outside of India, maybe. That's why we're going through it in, this, in the parallel series that's going on. But anyway, he brought up this quote, this wonderful quote, that I'm going to summarize it. Basically, there are several grades of enlightened beings. And they're all enlightened. Just their external manifestation may vary. The external manifestation may still include desires, activities, likes and dislikes, even irritability and anger. Huh? Just look at Parashuram, for example. <laughs> Parashuram was considered an incarnation of God. But he became so angry that he killed all the kshatriyas 21 times all over the world. Very angry. So even an incarnation of God can become angry. What to speak of uh, a jiva who attains self-realization. 
So this is an important point that it's not that when one attains complete enlightenment, he just becomes silent like a stone and doesn't do anything. Uh, maybe just sits in the corner. <laughs> Some people have this crazy idea. And not only that, it's not necessary that he manifest outwardly any symptoms of enlightenment. He may, like my sannyas guru, act just like an ordinary person and have easy, natural conversations with others uh, without any affectation or without any outward symptoms that, would th that make you think he's enlightened. And he fooled a lot of people. Huh? He fooled me in the beginning, too. It took me a long time, over a year, for me to realize, oh, he's enlightened. <laughs> so these are some of the uh, symptoms of jnani. It's not that a jnani has to give up everything and become a sannyasi. He simply has to give up the attachments to everything. Because that's the real sannyas, not necessarily, you know, putting on the red robe and all that. Although if you can do that, that's nice, because it shows a good example. But you may still have desires, different activities. Huh? Like Michael is a great painter. He paints about the social problems in the Kali Yuga, because people are never what they seem to be, and they're always got some angle and they're trying to <laughs> always trying to do something you know but anyway and and I like music for example well I used to I haven't done much music lately though been too busy with all this so the point is that Agnani retains his prarabdha karma his ripe karma the karma that is due for this lifetime anyway and he has to discharge all this karma, and then he's free. At the end of this life, he can go anywhere, be anything that he wants to be. So this is the uh, actual mechanism and function of the path. The path is represented in the human body by the Shushumna, going from the muladhar to the sahasrara. And the blocks, the obstacles on the path, are represented by the three grantis, the knots. Huh? These cause vortexes. Oh, and I forgot to mention something very important. Darn it, this is so complicated. <laughs> a vortex has a very interesting property of creating artificial mass. I call it fake mass or fake matter. Have you ever been in at the ocean at the beach? And when you're far out in the ocean, the waves come and go and you just kind of float up and down with the waves and there's no problem. But when you get into the breakers, the waves form a vortex. And because of the turbulence around the vortex, they act as if they have much more mass they hit you hard, don't they? They can knock you down, smash you into the, into the beach. So it appears like they have more mass than a smooth wave. That's because of the turbulence of the vortex. In the same way, when the life energy is turned into a vortex by the obstacle of attachment, it creates a fake mass. And this is what we think is I, myself, but that's the illusion. And that's why it's a block in the process of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung.